Welcome to our webinar, Ecoterms 2020. It's an interactive webinar and it's a Q&A session. So you guys can start submitting questions anytime throughout the webinar. You can start submitting them now if you want. Um, there is a Q&A button. It's going to be on the top of your screen or bottom of your screen. Just hit that Q&A and you can submit your question there anonymously or if you go ahead and submit it with your name, then if we don't get to your question, we can at least um, reply back to you outside of this webinar. So while you're submitting those questions, I'll talk about Scarborough for a minute. If you wanna head over to the next slide, we can show some of our companies. Um, so Scarborough is, Scarborough Group of Companies is a full service international domestic transportation provider. We're known for our expertise and customized solutions. We're a U.S. and Mexican customs broker, and we also offer warehousing and fulfillment services. We're headquartered in the heart of America, Kansas City, Missouri, with offices across the USA and close partners in every major port in the world. Uh, we also have locations at the border, on both sides of the border, um, between U.S. and Mexico. My name is Kim Taylor. I am the marketing director for Scarborough, and we're lucky to have with us today Allison and Patrick. They both bring a wealth of knowledge and, experience, and years of experience in both import and export operations. They're both Incoterms experts. And um, if you guys need help with anything, feel free to reach out to any of us um, for Incoterms consultation, supply chain consultation, anything that you need. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, if your company has a very complex supply chain, and you need help training or directing your internal, internal staff on Ecoterms or which terms to use, then we are happy to come in and help with that. So contact me, Kim Taylor, if you want more details on an in-depth customized Ecoterms training. Uh, for, we have a lot of questions already coming in. That's awesome. Um, yes, all of you guys will receive this presentation and the recording of this probably in the next week or so. So um, as long as you've registered for this, you will get a copy of that. And I think that's it. If you're just now joining us, make sure to submit your questions. And I think that's it. Allison, I will turn it over to you now. Okay, fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Schroer. I am the Corporate Compliance Manager here at Scarborough. I am a licensed customs broker and certified customs specialist, and I have been at Scarborough for just over 14 years. All right. And my name is Pat Colligan. I've been with Scarborough as well for 14 years. Looks like we have a lot in com common, Allison. <laughs> I'm also the licensed customs broker and certified customs specialist. And I got my start in the industry about 24 years ago in the JFK area. And today, you know, it really, my goal is to really answer your questions as thoroughly and as, uh, clearly as possible so you guys can really take something out of this. Thanks for joining us. All right, we'll get started. So the first question we, we have here is what is the ICC? Um, the ICC is the International Chamber of Commerce. It's the largest business organization in the world created to promote global trade and investment. Um, it's not owned by any one government. Uh, the ICC keeps the United Nations and the World Trade Organization in touch with views of international business. Um, really just kind of offers a good common language um, to be used all over the world for Incoterms. The first set of Incoterms was issued in 1936 and they're updated every 10 years. So, you know, here we are today talking about Incoterms 2020, you know, just last year, we were using 2010 and had been using it for the, you know, for the 10 previous years. So um, ICC rules today are used for the use of domestic and international trade terms. Yeah, so as Allison mentioned, I think the, the greatest thing that it does for us here really lets us speak a common language. You know, obviously we're doing business with people where English is not their first language. So, you know, these INCO terms, you know, allow us to get on the same page pretty quickly uh, with our, you know, international suppliers and buyers. So what are Incoterms? Incoterms are a set of 11 trade terms used in contracts for sale and purchase of goods. Um, definitely a thing that needs to be remembered is Incoterms are not law. It's strictly guidance. 
um, it's really transfer of risk is what you need to be thinking of when you think of incoderms. Um, it describes obligations and costs, who's paying for each you know, leg of the journey and getting your freight in and out of the country. Rules of thumb, uh, the party responsible for transportation arrangement and payment of transportation charges is in control of the cargo. And the more responsibility the party has, the more control they have. So they also, unfortunately, bear more risk. So you're looking at things like customs, you know, exams, licensing, you name it. Yeah. And I'll probably just point out one thing. I might have some questions on this later, so I might answer one of them right now. But you know, as far as the licensing goes on exports from the United States, at the end of the day, really, it is still up to the exporter, even if you're selling on an exports term, that you need to really determine licensability of your product. Um, while you can assign that to your buyer, it's got to be a very specific, you know, document that you guys agree on. I definitely, you know, recommend you put it in writing. And at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't even recommend you do so just because you know your product better than anybody. Uh, so let's just keep that in mind as far as licensing goes out of, you know, for exports from the States. Okay. Eco terms do not automatically apply. Um, definitely something to keep in mind when you're buying and selling you must discuss your inco terms there's there is no that's what i'm looking for there's no set that's standard. there's looking no for. standard for it yep so um they do not determine ownership it's a common misconception um but they do not determine ownership and they do not um address transfer of title which is i think is the biggest myth that we see is, uh, is title and ownership of the merchandise and they don't uh, just don't cover it. You know, that's within your contract between the buyer and seller and you can dictate that uh, in that contract wherever you'd like to, whether it's 10% of payment, 50%, 100%, you name it, that's negotiable between you and your, your supplier or buyer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do not de determine payment terms. Uh, they do not act as a substitute for a contract, define contractual rights, except for delivery, or breach of contract remedies. They do not protect parties from their own risk or loss, or cover the goods before or after delivery. I think that's something people forget about. Yeah, insurance in general, I think, really needs to be addressed almost separately, even though the, you know, the INCO term would dictate that the seller would, would need the, the insurance. Uh, I would verify that they're getting it, just get on the same page with that because under a lot of these terms, they're really under no obligation to, to purchase insurance. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, uh, they do not specify details of the transfer, transport or delivery of the goods. For example, example container loading is not considered packaging and definitely would need to be addressed um, in your contract. And then the only INCO term that specifies unloading is our new INCO term this year, DPU. Okay, so um, I'm just going to reiterate this. I know that you mentioned this um, really quick, but somebody already has asked about it. So let's just touch on it again. I understand that INCO terms do not dictate the point where title to goods transfer or revenue recognition. Is this correct? Uh, yes, that is spot on. Uh, these matters should be specified within the provisions of your contract uh, with your customer or vendor. Great, thank you. All right. Okay, so we'll get right into Incoterms 2020. Things to remember, there is always a named point associated with every Incoterm. You can't just say, it's FOB. You have to, if you look down at the bottom here in this box, we've got examples. You're going to ship FOB Houston, Texas. Um, the name point identifies where the goods are delivered, where risk transfers from the seller to buyer with exception of C terms, which maybe we can get into that a little, little mm -hmm. more. Um, and who is responsible for insurance, packaging, loading, transport, arrangements, costs, origin, and destination customs responsibilities. Um, so right under here, we've got kind of the best practice here for how to list your INCO term. Your start with your INCO term, your named point, and then end with INCO terms 2020. Yeah, it's like when we see commercial invoices day in and day out, and I'd probably say 
15% to 20% really had the full name, you know, listing the actual Inco term, you know, what year they're working off and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, go back up to the exception of the C term. If you are typically when you're buying on a C term, you're buying, if it's an import into the United States, CFR New York. Okay. But your risk obligation actually starts once that container crosses the rail on the ship and is loaded on the ship in say Southampton, the UK. So if that falls off the boat on the way to New York in between, you're still on the hook. Uh, you are the one at risk at that point, which is different when you're say buying on a D term, uh, DAP, that would be delivered to your you know, place of business and the shipper is on, uh, at risk the whole way. All right. Okay, so the major Inco terms 2020 changes. Um, there's not, I mean, there are definite changes. They're kind of, in my opinion, a little underwhelming, but <laughs> we do have we do have a couple of changes to go over. Um, so cost items are now spelled out under the seller and buyer, making it easier to understand where the cost was born. Um, if you look at the Inco terms 2020 book, um, it's really laid out nicely in there to For make sure. it much easier to understand. Uh, the new Inco terms point uh, points out risks exist when a buyer or seller becomes the importer or exporter of record in a foreign country. So that's a that's a good addition. Uh, the security requirements in relation to transportation related issues are covered in the new Inco terms 2020. Uh, they are now written to uh, include arrangement of freight by non carriers. Oh, here's uh, yeah, the Inco terms 2020 design is more user friendly than 2010. So looking back at that, your Inco terms book, it's it's a lot easier to yeah, navigate. They're definitely spelling things out a little more thoroughly, which is always good. Mm -hmm. um, good old DAT delivered at terminal was omitted. I really don't know that I actually saw too many people use those the last you and, you and me both. last I, ten years. Maybe on some truck shipments here and there, but mm -hmm. not, not a whole lot of international. So we said goodbye to DAT and we said hello to DPU delivered to door and unloaded. And last but not least, uh, the CIP default insurance coverage has been changed from free of particular average to all risk. Hmm. Well, if you're buying on the CIP term, that's good news for you uh, because all risk coverage is a much broader coverage than free of particular average. Uh, FPA, FPA covers uh, you know, transportation perils, you know, sinking, being stranded, fire, and things like that. But it won't include such things as a you know war risk or a strike or a riot unless you actually specify that. So if you're buying on that uh, CIF term, if you want the you know those things covered, you'd have to specify with your your supplier. So since you guys just went through several of the major Inco terms um, that were changed in the past decade, um, we do have a question. What's your opinion of the most significant, what are like two or three of the most significant changes that you see? I'd say this, well, significant, they've, they've added one mm -hmm. and they've deleted one. That's pretty significant. And I think that I think the most significant thing is they've detailed out a little more of what costs are borne by whom. Uh, so they're spelling that out a little more, which I think is a great thing. I wish they would have um, added origin export clearance. Uh, they, you know, they really haven't uh, put that on a separate line item, which what I'd like to see. But I think they are, you know, starting to incorporate uh, you know, more specifics in, you know, which particular costs. As, as you know, if you're buying freight, you know, your invoice typically doesn't come in a one line item. You know, you're going to get your charge quite a bit, terminal handling, unloading, loading, especially if you're boom, moving LCL. So I think, uh, you know, they're getting closer to getting most of the costs covered. And then just to answer another question that was asked, DPU right there stands for delivered to door and unloaded. Yes. Um, we've, we've got another question here. Um, if contracts or negotiations already exist with Incoterms 2010, do you recommend keeping them the same or renegotiating to Incoterms 2020? That's a good question, uh, but I would uh, I would say I definitely recommend that you you uh, do put Inco Terms twenty twenty and renegotiate that. Uh, it's good to be working off the most updated Inco Terms within your contracts. And, you know, again, there hasn't been a ton of change. Uh, however, however, it would be wise to 
review the specific term you're using uh, to verify. Now, if you are um, writing out in contracts or POs, which Incoterm you're using, is it a good practice to indicate Incoterms 2020 on the documentation, or is it just known and defaulted to Incoterms 2020? Uh, no, it's, it's not known because when we I sometimes see stuff going back even further than 2010, to be honest with you. You know, there's some, it's amazing. But so, yeah, I definitely updated the show 2020. You're right, then you're on the same page and you're working off the latest and greatest. Thank you for that. Okay. So here is a Incoterms 2020 chart of responsibility. Uh, we'll just kind of walk through some of the layout on here. Um, it's very um, nicely put together. Look at the top, you can see which um, Inco terms apply to each mode of transport. X works and the F terms up to, well, FCA are any transport mode. And then you walk over to the right and you'll see your C and inland waterway transport. And that takes you all the way over to CIF. And then we're back into any transport mode again with CPT on. Um, down the left hand column, down the side, you'll see all of the, basically the points along the way, yep. the transfer of risk, the commercial invoice, the packaging, you know, loading all, all, every step of the way. And this just walks you through who is responsible for each portion. I really do like the transfer of risk across the top here as well. It really kind of lays it out and makes it yeah. pretty simple. Um, things to remember, your commercial invoice, your packaging, quality control, and markings are all on the seller side. They must take care of all of those. The one thing I see there, you know, the export duty and taxes. I, you know, I don't know if you see a whole lot of that out there. Um, you know, if you're selling something, typically the country that you're residing in isn't going to kind of tax you. But I mean, there's maybe a handful of countries that do that, but it's not a not a whole lot. Um, oh, go ahead. You're fine, go ahead. Um, we just had somebody come in, come in here and ask, although there's not like a hard or fast rule to really answer this question, but which e eco terms do you think are the best eco terms to use? How would you answer that in, with this chart that we're looking at? Well, yeah, it's definitely gonna come down to your business decision and you know how much risk you want and how much control you want. Uh, we recommend you, you use an FCA or an F term uh, because you know, think about it this way. I mean, freight's not a tangible product, obviously, but if you're paying for it at the end of the day. You know, if you're buying widgets at a dollar a widget, and then but you're buying it delivered to your door, within that dollar is the cost of the freight somewhere in there. They're not doing it for free, and they probably might have some margin in the freight themselves, right? So if you're buying something, I mean, I want to, if I'm going to buy a car, I want to choose the color. I want to choose my accessories. You know, I want the, the sunroof. I want that type of thing. And you don't get that if you buy on a term other than an F or an E. So with the F term, you know, you're, you're choosing your transiton, you're choosing your carrier, your forwarder, you're choosing, okay, I want to be known, you know, notified on this milestone or that milestone. So that's why we recommend that you get that control. Yeah. You bear some more risk, but uh, you, know, you get the control out of it. And, and, and then you also get to control your costs. Uh, and I think also it gives you a, you know, a huge advantage in just supply chain visibility. So would you agree with the um, be best practice to buy on F terms and sell on C terms? I would, correct. Yes. And then also if you're selling on a C term, you know, it's, you're showing the, the, uh, the buyer that, hey, look, I got things in place. I have, you know, all these processes I can do, I can, I got all these agreements with my carriers and it might just make your product a little bit easier to sell. It's a, you know, if, make, if you make it easier for them, I mean, that's, you know, our job here for our customers at Scarborough is to make uh, their jobs easier. So it, it just might show them uh, that you can do that. And then additionally, you know, you could put some margin in there yourself. Mm -hmm. So I got another question that popped up. Um, We've got somebody on here asking, where can we get a copy of this book? Meaning the, the Inco Terms actual published book published by the ICC. And you can actually purchase that. Um, I saw that they are selling, maybe some third party sellers are selling them on Amazon, but you can also purchase it direct from their website. I will send out a link um, when I send out the recording and the presentation for this. I'll send out a link so you can go out and purchase that book. We do recommend that um, you do purchase that. It goes very much more in depth on each of the Inco terms. 
Um, also, I wanted to point out that this actual chart, the, the chart of responsibility, um, what we call the chart of responsibility, you guys can download this online through our website. I'll send a downloadable PDF to you. But also, if you want to purchase some hard stock copies, we can sell those in, the bu in bundles. So um, again, just contact me, Kim Taylor, and I can get you set up with uh, shipping off several of these cardstock. They're very nice, um, durable EcoTerms charts. And on the back of them, we also have a ocean container dimension cheat sheet sort of thing. So um, let me know if you're interested in that. I think that's it for questions right now. All right. So now we're just going to kind of go through and take a little bit closer look at um, each of the terms here. So we're going to start with X works or the, I guess, X terms. Um, always insert your named place of delivery. So this is going to be where you have the most control. You have, you have all the control, basically. Um, the seller's obligations are really just to complete the goods as promised, package the goods, create the commercial invoice. Um, do their quality control checks, make sure all your country of origin markings are on your goods, um, and then make them available at the named place. And then loading is not required by the seller, but it can be specified. And then, you know, once again, you really have all of the control. Um, all, the, all the risk is on you. And this is one that if you really want to have all, you know, all the control, you can, but there's things to keep in mind with X works. Most definitely. And you know, one thing with the loading, you know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of time you show up with a truck, your, your, your uh, seller is going to get it loaded. I haven't seen um, too many issues where we, you know, we've shown up with a truck on an X works term where the guy says, well, you got to hire some forklift driver to come here in my premises, but Hey, make it specific. Like uh, we mentioned, um, you know, the, the one area is where we probably not recommend X works is where you have some countries where there's a little instability, any political turmoil. I would recommend you stay away from doing X works in those areas. And I'd also recommend you stay away from do, doing uh, X works in countries where the export clearance process isn't just, it's not clear or it's not, I would say it's not easy. If it takes several days and it's a real paper driven process, I'd, I'd stay away from it. Uh, there's, there might be some things in there you don't want to find out about, <laughs> uh, you know, so, you know, countries such as, uh, you know, Brazil and Russia, those, those are areas I probably recommend you, you know, you stay away from the X-Works term because at the end of the day, you're going to be responsible to get the cargo cleared for exportation. So when, when would you recommend using X-Works for a shipment? Are there specific regions or when you say that there's risk involved, what are those risks? Well, the risks are if something goes wrong, uh, it's, it's down to you to fix it. Um, you know, if, it, if there's damage, if there's something falls off a ship or something like that, it's on your, it's on your, you've, a, you know, you're on the hook for the risk. And risks, yeah, risks of, da you know, uh, navigating, you know, a foreign country's clearance yeah. requirements. Yeah, so, if, you know, if there's a delay in export clearance and now you're sitting at an, aer uh, an airport somewhere or a warehouse near the airport and for some reason there's a, you know, there's some issues going on with the, there's a strike over there. And now it's sitting at two weeks, three weeks at an airport warehouse for clearance. Uh, guess who's paying the cost for those storage charges, which probably aren't cheap. It's you as the buyer as on an X-Works term. Are there certain regions that you would suggest X-Works or that maybe use X-Works a little bit more than others? Yeah, we see X-Works more out of uh, Europe, European countries. Uh, China's more of an F-term market, but we definitely see more and more X-Works too out of there. You know, such volume coming out of there that's, um, you know, it's definitely, it's not a big risk, I would say. But those are the two main areas or regions that uh, we see exports terms. I mean, even out of in India, I see it uh, uh, pretty commonly. On an export shipment, who's responsible to provide the SLI or file the AES? Okay, so now we're talking exports from the States. Um, at the end of the day, on an exports term, um, coming out of the United States, the buyer, which is a routed export transaction, the buyer on a routed export tra transaction is responsible to authorize their chosen forwarder to file the AES. Um, however, the shipper is still responsible to provide the buyer's forwarder 
with many data elements listed on the SLI. But technically, the, the seller is not required to, pro to provide an SLI to the forwarder that their buyer has chosen. At the end of the day, the forwarder needs the shipper's or buyer's authorization to file the AES. You know, the forwarder needs it from somebody. Uh, the issue that you know, we run into as forwarders is that the buyers overseas don't know that. So you know, they're buying it on, you know, and they're selling on x worst term, but they don't know that they have to give a power of attorney or a shipper's letter of instruction to somebody in the States. It's just they don't, they're not informed of that. So at the end of the day, what winds up happening in a lot of cases is the you know, the forwarders are sending the SLI to the shippers, uh, you know, to expedite the shipment and just get things moving. As the seller, is there a downside to X-Works? Yes, there is, I'd say. Uh, number one, you might be dealing with a different forwarder every week uh, because your customer's going with the cheap and cheerful one for the week. <laughs> um, and then plus, you know, if you, you know, if you are then filling out an SLI and you're not controlling the export information that you're sending to customs yourself it doesn't matter which forwarder is filing for you if they do it wrong it's your problem you know you are the us ppi so we recommend that if you're using an x-work term okay and you're going to have all these other forwarders that might be doing it or maybe it's just one forwarder but get the uh, export data you know have them send what they've transmitted you know to customs to you so you can verify it's accurate that's the best practice and you know, if you're doing that and you know your license uh, determination information is, is sound, uh, those, that's a good practice to, to abide by. Um, I've got one more question here and it kind of pertains to all of the, the new groups. Um, if we are buying under XWorks named port today, Incoterms 2010, what is the difference with the change to Incoterms 2020? And that same question is posed with FOB as well. So if we are buying under XWorks or FOB named port today, 2010, what is the difference with the changes between the two? I don't think there is any. Um, and with XWorks, you know, we really don't see XWorks named port typically. If you're buying XWorks, you're picking it up from your shipper's factory in most cases. Um, and with the F terms, you know, we haven't, there hasn't been a ton of change in between those from 2010 to 2020 either. You know, if it's FOB, you know, Felix Doe, you know, that there's no, there's no difference from the 2010 to the 2020. Great. I think we can move on to F terms. Fantastic. Okay. The F terms, um, as Pat mentioned earlier, this is kind of where we recommend you, you sit if you're importing, um, you know, starting with FCA, it's any transport mode. So this is going to be just an easy one to go with. Um, moving into FAS and FOB, these are only ocean. So things to remember, you can't use FOB, um, let's say Kansas City <laughs> right. or, you know, an, an airport. You need to make sure you're using FOB and FAS for, an, you know, ocean cargo and then, well, inland waterway. So your seller's obligations in the F terms um, is, are just to make the goods available at the named port of the buyer's choice and the export customs formalities. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest one. So if you're buying on FCA with the big, the big difference here really, because most FCA term that we see is still FCA shippers premises, but in FCA opposed to X works, they're taking care of the export customs formalities which is great. Let them, you know, that's, they're in that country. They know their regulations. You probably don't, may not want to. So let them take care of that. But the one thing I would make a note of is we see, a, we have a lot of FCA customers, but we see a lot of the cost for the clearance still trying to come collect. So you'll see on the invoice, you know, customs clearance, origin export clearance, 50 bucks, something out of China is about that. Brazil, probably a lot more. And, you know, in those, if you see that, you should push back against your, your seller and say, look, I'm buying FCA, your, your warehouse, you need to pay that charge. Okay, what's the main difference between FCA and FOB? Really, FOB is used um, at the port. Um, so it's FOB um, New Delhi, FOB Mumbai. And then additionally, uh, on FOB, the origin terminal handling is uh, now payable by the, the shipper uh, instead of you paying it on the other two F terms. 
FOB is, is water only and FCA is also, it, it's all modes as well is another difference. Yes. Got another question here. Um, let's see. If our company is responsible, and I don't know if there's enough detail on this question or not. If our company is responsible for inland freight to Miami port, what would be the best terms to use, FCA or DAP? Well, you wouldn't be using a DAP term in that scenario, really. I would call that, you can use, you can use F, FCA or FOB. You just need to specify the name spot. So um, if you want to do FOB Miami, then you need to get it down to the Miami port, and then you're responsible for all those charges to, to do so. Um, and then on the FCA part of it, it's the same really, but you're, all, you know, you're also responsible for the, the export clearance. Is it a true statement that ECO terms that are used for Dominican Republic may not work for Jamaica? I don't think so, no. I think ECO terms are pretty universal. I haven't seen ever getting involved in an area where you know, one country has not adopted the ECO term. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. Can you explain the difference between FAS and FOB? We're back into the, you know, we're back into the difference here between origin terminal handling. Um, FAS is the buyer's responsible for the origin terminal handling and the buyer just has to get the goods alongside the vessel. And then free on board, you're getting the goods on board the vessel. Yeah, it's really just crossing those rails is the mm -hmm. only difference. You, you, you get it on FAS, you're just getting it to the terminal. And in FOB, you're, you're pretty much getting it on board. Thank you. If we're buying goods to ship to Long Beach, then rail to Dallas, can we still use FOB? So this looks like an import to me. If we are buying goods to ship to Long Beach, then rail to Dallas, can we still use FOB? Most definitely. Yep. You can never be usually again FOB you're going to see the origin port name that you got to follow that you know just again FOB by itself means nothing. So you know if you're uh, to say that's coming out of Asia going via Long Beach it would be FOB Shanghai and then you specify to your customer well you specify to your forwarder you know in that case that you want it to Dallas Dallas ramp. And though it says FOB is is you know ocean only where the FOB ocean is the, the portion we're looking at is the main carriage, Correct. which is going to be the ocean freight, mm -hmm. not, not the rail inland. And also you can't use FOB country name. It has to be the city, the port. Yes, you want to be specific here. Definitely. Be, be, be specific. All right, let's keep moving forward. I don't see any more F group questions at the moment. Okay, C terms. So the C terms, um, we're just looking at, you know, CFR and CIF. Your, your C and inland waterway only. Um, once again, make sure to insert your named port of destination for CFR and CIF. And for CIF, insurance is covered by the seller. So the C terms are the only places here that we see um, insurance is specifically called out mm -hmm. um, on responsibility. So when we move down to CPT and CIP, um, all modes of transport, you also remember to insert your named place of destination and for CIP, insurance is covered by the seller as well. So your seller's obligations here are transport arrangements, um, the charges associated with transport and uh, most of the costs to the named place. Yeah, and the, and the reason why we say we don't recommend a, a C term, say on an importation, is I'll give you an example. You have a container coming in and something's happened. You got a line down situation now. Who am I? Who do you contact? You may not even know. You contact your shipper. They, they tell you to call Joe Blow in, in Miami. Uh, you try to get a hold of him. You don't know. He doesn't know you from Adam. I mean, that's, that's, that's a difficult situation when you got 100 people breathing down your neck for that cargo. So, you know, just bear that in mind and also bear in mind, like we see in a lot of cases, especially if you're buying LCL, uh, say to Chicago, so C, C and F Chicago on an LCL shipment, 
you know, it's, you're happy, you know, the shipper's taking care of it all. It's pretty much close to your door. But then what you don't realize is that when it gets here, all the destination costs are collect and you haven't negotiated any charges with anybody and boom, you bring it in, you know, a cubic meters worth of cargo and you got 450 bucks to pay just to get it in and out of container and, and onto your truck. So there's another, there's some pitfalls with that, which, uh, you know, you should just be mindful of. Yeah, some, uh, we've had instances where clients have had full containers shipped to, you know, we'll say CPT LA, and then you have to unload the container and truck that all the way inland. And sometimes that costs more than just booking it all the way in, you know, inland on the rail. No, it's only even more than the ocean freight. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. So can I use CIP or CPT Incoterms for ocean freight? Yes, you can. All modes. Terrific. Yeah, we don't have a whole lot of uh, C group questions, but now that we're on D terms, we've got a lot coming in, so get ready. (laughs) (laughs) So your D terms, these are all any mode of transport and the seller is responsible for the transport arrangements in their related charges to the end uh, destination. So just the, you know, the differences between them, they're they're very few. Um, DAP is delivered to door only. DPU is delivered to door and unloaded. And DDP is delivered to door and loaded and duties and taxes are paid for by your seller. And this is where the DAT um, term was removed here on this version. Yeah, they removed the DAT and the, they put in the DPU. And you know, if I'm a seller and I'm, or even I'm a buyer, the, you know, the unloading a destination, being responsible for that, is a, it sounds a little tricky to me. You know, unless, you know, there's specifics. I mean, I, I see this maybe happening in more overdimensional cargo when you need a crane or something like that, where, you know, you do, the buyer doesn't want to have to arrange for that. But that puts the onus on your shipper to really know the layout of your facility and such, too. You know, can you bring in, you know, the, the necessary crane, you know, into your facility with, you know, different uh, height requirements and specifications and weight specifications? So, I'd be a little concerned about using that DPU and, you know, expecting your seller to to figure out the unloading. I mean, you, you know, talk about it and work it out. It can happen, but I'd just be a little bit concerned about it. And then on the other end of things too, as a seller, I would not sell on DDP terms um, because once again, dealing with that foreign country's customs clearance process could get sticky. Okay, so let's talk about that DPU versus DAP real quick. I've got a question here, and it says that we ship to South Korea using DAP Inco terms, and we recently came across a problem where warehouse charges came into the question. Would DPU be a better option so to solve us of any warehouse changes that might incur and pass that on to my buyer? I'd like to know which warehouse we're talking here. Is it, a, is it your actual, I guess it's the actual buyer's warehouse. And That's uh, what it would appear to. Okay. Well, if you're selling on a DAP term, uh, then any charges at the warehouse, really, you, you're responsible to just get it there. You know, they're responsible to get it unloaded. Uh, you know, it, actually, it says right there, it's negotiable. So it's between the buyer or the seller, you know, opposed to DPU, where it's up to the seller to get it unloaded. So if you have some costs for, for warehousing, you know, on a DAP term, that's just something you want to address and, and see if you can figure out, you know, who's got to pay for it. I would not want to pay for somebody else's warehouseman. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know the going rate over there and I wouldn't want to be involved in it uh, at the end of the day. That's, but that's obviously my opinion. So let's talk about the risk with DDP. We've got several questions that came in. So I'm going to list them all out and then we can talk about them. Um, under DDP, who is the importer of record if the seller uses the wrong HGS code who is liable who is responsible for import clearance charges with D terms and do DDP terms include current tariffs so this is several different people's questions so I think you guys can answer this yeah why don't you just much as start from the top again yeah. uh, and we'll answer them one by one okay under DDP who is the importer of record and if the seller uses the wrong HGS code who's liable Seller on the seller. On a DDP term, if it's an import into the states, your seller is the importer of record. They should have filled out a power attorney to, to the customs broker here in the states. 
and they are responsible to pay the duty and be the importer of record. Uh, duties and tax. So if they if they mess up the uh, the tariff, it's up to them that they, they have to pay the you know the duty that they you know chosen uh, based on that HTS. So that's there's a risk right there. Now if, you know if they've chosen the wrong tariff, and it's now now inevitably if you're buying from them, the duty is incorporated in the cost of the product as well. So if they mess the, the tariff classification up, and it should have been a two percent duty rate, but they think it's a five percent, so you're actually paying an extra three percent in there. And, and would that be the same on an export out of the United States with DDP terms as well? For the most part. Yeah. There are, there are some countries that don't allow for DDP. Mm -hmm. um, Mexico being one, mm -hmm. uh, Brazil being another, I believe, yeah. But yes, this, you as a seller would still be responsible for being the importer of record and paying your duties and taxes. And that's on the selling side, like Patrick just said, you need to make sure you're covering your cost. And if you assumed that it was a 3% and you get it delivered and cleared through customs and come back and find your duty rate was 12%, well, you're out. Do, does DDP terms, do they include current tariffs? I think what that's meaning say like the additional tariffs, maybe the section 301 or 232. Well, yeah, it, it is what it is. The product isn't, you know, no matter who the importer of record is, the, you know, the product is, should be classified properly, which is the most important thing as an importer to get right, to be honest. So, yes, if it's, it's eligible for Section 301 or Section 232 tariff, in addition to the standard HDS, you know, tariff within Chapters 1 and, uh, you know, 97, then, yeah, that's, uh, it's definitely still applicable. Can you guys uh, maybe touch on some of the risk involved with DDP, much like the X Works sort of risk involved? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I what I see, we see a lot is is this. You know, they bought a DDP. It gets to say O'Hare Airport, and you know, you call up the forwarder who your shipper told you to contact, and it says, "Well, we didn't get the power of attorney from them. You, you mind signing for us here?" Because uh, it's you know. Again, a lot of the sellers won't know, okay, I need to get a power of attorney for it to be cleared. You don't need that in a lot of other countries. So they could be selling to, you know, another country such as India, where you know, on a DDP term, but they never had to fill out any power of attorney form. It's kind of unique for the States, I believe, in some aspect. Uh, but so that's a big thing we see with DDP, where now it's here, it's, you know, it's 2,000 kilos. Nobody's got the authorization to file the customs clearance. And guess what? The, the airlines give us 24 hours free. So... We got some issues, obviously on a DDP term, all that should go back to uh, the, the seller, but you want the product, don't you? So that's one area where we you know, want our buyers to avoid DDP because the sellers just don't know the rules and regulations here, you know, as you do as an importer, or you would if you reached out to a broker to get that information. And as a seller, why should I avoid DDP? Well, I think, uh, again, just the same reasons why, you know, with the, the tariff situation and the clearance situation, you know, if you're, if you're confident with your folder and their agent ab abroad that they have, uh, you know, everything buttoned down and, and everything, the process is mapped out, then, okay, it's, you know, it's definitely possible. There's not, you know, it's not, can't, I won't say DP can't be used, but there's just a lot more risk. You know, you are on the hook to get all the way to the door. So again, if there's something going wrong in that destination country, there's a riot, there's a strike, there's something that pops up, you know, again, you're on the hook. And then additionally, if you get into places such as Europe, you know, there's a, there's a GST involved and a VAT involved, and that should be specified, you know, initially within the contract, who's paying that. And I've seen it uh, both ways where the, you know, the importer, you know, who's in the United States gets registered over there and is able to claim back the VAT. I think that's a pretty laborious uh, challenge and, and mm -hmm. process, but you, it can be done. I've, and I, I have some clients that have that do it. Um, but it's a lot easier for the company in the destination country to claim that bat back. And at the end of the day, there's no way you can kind of incorporate that into your product, and it'll be you know a viable uh, product to be sold at the destination country, because the bat and the GST can be you know up to 20% in some cases. So we actually have several questions about the GST and that um, since there's no actual INCO term that specifies that, um, how do you suggest we go about um, maybe excluding that on an INCO term? For example, I have a question here that says, can you have DDP excluding that? 
Most definitely. And that's just something you want to specify in your contract and your PO, put in there, you know, DDP, Inco Terms 2020, uh, and I'd write down the, the delivery address or the, the city name it's going to, excluding any duty or any GST or VAT. Make that specific. So you want to be as specific as possible and not just assume that VAT or, or GST is incorporated with those DDP terms. Most definitely. And, and a lot of com again, a lot of companies over there uh, that, uh, that are familiar with the, you know, the GST and VAT have an account on file with the, you know, the local government. You know, they claim back that uh, VAT and GST once they sell the product on, you know, they set it up in a couple of different ways. It's quarterly, it's yearly. It's a, actually, it's up to their discretion on how, you know, how, quick, how, much, how many times they want to claim it back. Okay. With the term DAP, delivering to a foreign consignee, is it necessary to provide company name, city, and country, or is city country sufficient? I think city and country is sufficient. I don't know that you need to have the name of the company. That's not how the eco terms are laid out. Yeah, I just put the, you know, DAP in the city name is uh, pretty specific where it's going to. Um, maybe you read that one more time, Kim. Kim. With the term DAP delivering to a foreign consignee, is it necessary to provide the company name along with the city and country or just the city and country is sufficient? And yeah. I think we probably need to add the address and zip code or postal code in there too. Wouldn't hurt, but typically we see on a commercial invoice, DOP, Kansas City, Missouri door. Um, at the end of the day, the, comp the company name is already on the commercial invoice or it should be because that, you know, you're billing for the product. Uh, I, I, I don't think it would hurt, but it's just not uh, something typically we see. Uh, this goes back to the VAT again. Um, if we ship from Asia to Italy using our customer's forwarder, can we use DAP terms and still be considered the importer of record so we will be responsible for the VAT? And not on a DAP term, really, it's the responsibility of the Italian company to be the importer and pay the duties in the VAT on a DAP term. Thank you. We have several more questions, so let's get through these. If I sell DDP and I request the support from the consignee for customs clearance, in the case that the country does not allow me to be a foreign importer of record to clear it, should I change INCO terms on negotiation and documentation? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If they're going to be the importer, and, but you're still paying the duty, you know, it's still DDP at the end of the day. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have that agreement where they're the importer, that's great. Let them take care of that. Just, I would, you know, obviously work closely with them to make sure that product's classified properly. You know what that percentage is going to be. And, and I would say get familiar also with, you know, their broker that they're using at the destination country, you know, have some kind of dialogue with them just to make sure that you're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Okay. Under the terms DAP, can we use DAP US or Canadian port of entry? No, I wouldn't recommend that, you know, with, because it's, it's a delivered term. So it's, it's got, it should, should show a door. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe the question wasn't asked with much detail, but we do actually see DAP terms on a lot of domestic type moves or in that case, North American type moves. But yeah, you would have to use the door address with that. Can you clarify who's responsible for demurrage and detention under DAP? That's a tough one, I think. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's up, to, you know, it's, <coughs> it's gonna depend on the circumstance, I think. Um, is it not being delivered because the forwarder you hired to get it delivered was inept or unable to do so? Or is it going into storage and demerge because the customs broker has not done the, their job properly? Or there's, you know, another, a, there's another reason um, outside of that, you know, so it comes, it's going to have to come down to the specific um, a reason, I'd say, the specific mm -hmm. situation. But I would say this, that if you're buying a DAP term, if there's costs 
such as detention and demerge that aren't really listed on here. And it's going to be a little bit of a tough fight. I mean, you're going to want your cargo. So if it's now cleared in the storage is X and there's, you have to start fighting with your supplier about it. It's the clock's still ticking. So, you know, that's, that's the, I would say if there's a term like that, where there's not a, the, the specific cost that's involved is not listed out there. It's really, a, it's going to be borne by the, the buyer. You know, such as saying a customs exam, who's going to pay in that situation? That's a, that's a charge that your, your shipper has not foreseen. So that's going to be for the, the account of the consignee. Okay, I've got one more D term question. This one just makes me laugh, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Where is the DDU? Oh, we missed DDU. Oh, we lost them in 2010. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was replaced by DAP. 10 years ago. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our next slide and then we'll jump back into more questions if we've got time. Okay. All right, just, um, we, you know, we've addressed a few of these throughout the course, you know, of this uh, webinar, but just kind of circling back around on things to just to watch out for. Um, trading houses, making sure you're specific with the named place of destination. Uh, your shipping costs built into the price per unit. And this is really important to think about. If your supplier is selling you your widget for a dollar a piece and, you know, 20 cents of that is freight and that's not broken out on your invoice, you're going to be paying duties and taxes on your freight as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Plus, they mark it up. <clears throat> yeah, and I would also add that if you say you're buying that widget at a dollar, how long is that the value good? six months, whatever you nego negotiated. If you're buying out of, say, China, um, guess what? Right after the Chinese New Year, the freight rates are going to drop through the, the floor. Uh, is your price for the widget going to go down? I don't think so. Probably not. So, <laughs> you know, there's a there's in markets with the high volatility, like bear that in mind. Um, definitely do your homework. We really suggest that you um, be the one to suggest the ENCO term make a push for whatever makes sense, you know, the most sense for you and your business. Uh, insurance, as we mentioned before, there's just a couple of C terms that specify who's responsible for insurance. So make sure this is discussed up front and put it in your contract, get it in writing, make sure it's determined who is getting, who's covering the yeah. insurance. Yeah, because I mean, you would assume on a D term that your shipper is going to do it, but again, they really don't have an obligation to do so. I mean, if they're smart, they, they've got it and they've, they've done it, but you know, talk about it for sure. Mm -hmm. um, just the buyer's liability when buying on X works. You know, we talked a lot about that just because you're liable for everything. And then, oh, and then shippers building in margin if sold on a D or C term. So, yeah, we just talked about yep, that. Yeah, we just hit that. Okay, so um, you want to move on to Q and A? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left for Q and A. If you guys want to go ahead and keep sending them in, we will reach back out to you afterwards and answer your questions. Just in case we don't get to them, there's several we probably will not get to. Um, but there's a lot of things that we probably could reiterate that um, are some questions that are coming through. So the first one I'm going to ask is, if you have not defined risk of loss or title transfer point in the contract, how do the ENCO terms act as the default for guidance? Oh, what about title transfer? Do the ENCO terms show that? No, no, not at all. That's uh, the biggest myth out there. Uh, that is going to be the title is going to be between you and the, the seller or the buyer, whatever you're, you know, whichever way you're moving. That's got to be agreed outside of the INCO term, uh, period. Okay, here's another one along the lines of that. If your PO is your contract with the vendor, then do the INCO terms have any legal influence on the transaction? No, no. Um, no that, that's something also to address, you know, get specifics, you know, if there's any type of, you know, grievance with the contract, there's something goes wrong, you know, that has to be specified within the contract. The INCO term is not going to, not going to dictate that. You know, as, as far as, you know, if there is a, you know, going to be a lawsuit or something, what, uh, you know, what countries 
regulations are going to be imposed, that's, that's something you want to talk to your seller about and specifying the contract. Okay. Um, again, this is another one you guys just hit on, but maybe reiterate it. Which side decides which term is going to be used, the buyer or the seller? You agree, you know, you, you have to come to an agreement together. It's mutual. Yep. And what's the best way to determine the importer of record for each in INCO term? The importer of record uh, is the United, the, uh, the United States party on importation on every term outside of DDP. And on exports out of the United States, the importer of record is the, the company receiving the merchandise uh, except DDP as well. And those, there is some room for negotiation within there when you're selling on a DDP where, where you might possibly not be allowed to be a non-resident importer where your customer is the importer, but you're gonna pay the duty. But here in the, you know, the States, technically, whoever's the importer record is paying the, the duty. So if I have a power of attorney from ABC company, I'm billing ABC company, and they're the importer, I'm billing that company for the duty and tax. Okay. Uh, does VGM come into play in any ECO term or is this negotiable? Our freight forwarder completes this on our behalf as we do not have the ability. This can be an issue for the seller under XWorks. Yeah, if it's an XWorks term, that's uh, the VGM fees come and uh, collect. So, you know, VGM is an origin cost. So, if, again, you're buying on an FOB term, FOB uh, Shanghai. And the VGM cost really, I would say, would be borne by the shipper. Okay, I've got a couple other questions in here that I might answer. Um, if we have additional questions, who can we use as a resource and will we receive a copy of this presentation? Um, well, you're welcome to use us as a resource if you have any other questions. Um, Allison and Patrick are both IncoTerms experts. If you have a very complex supply chain, in your organization, you can contact me, Kim Taylor, um, for some in-depth customized training to kind of help direct your people on which Inco terms you want them to use. Um, you can email that consulting at Scarborough email right there on the screen. I will be sending out an email with the recording along with the presentation, the ICC um, Inco terms book link to buy that direct from ICC um, along with some other um, information. So um, hopefully that answers that. For all of you that have sent in questions um, that we did not get to today, we will go ahead and reach out to you and have those questions answered to you directly. Um, so I've got a couple other questions that I can hit on since we've got about two more minutes, unless you two want to want to chime in and say anything. No, bring them on. Okay. As a seller, not the buyer, if my export shipment is under an LC for payment, letter of credit for payment, which term would be best for me to try and get the buyer to accept? I would so still- as a, as a seller from the United States and my export shipments under a letter of credit for payment, what term would be the best to try to get the buyer to accept that? I'd start going to the C term as an exportation because you know with the LC, Obviously, the documentation is critical. Um, so you're now choosing the folder you're confident in, and you know, there's amendments to do. You you have a contact, you know who to go to to get it done. Uh, so I would highly recommend with an LC that you you know you're looking at that C term because again you're driving and you got the, the people here that can help you that you know. What's the difference between a routed transaction and a related transaction? Um, I think the difference is the related transaction is between two companies that are the same, uh, probably the same ownership st uh, structure and such. Uh, so ABC company USA to ABC company UK, that would be a related party transaction. Uh, and a routed export transaction is, uh, is when, it's your, when you're as a seller from the United States, you're, you're selling on an XWorks term and your shipper is coordinating everything from your door uh, to theirs. Is it recommended that we have our INCO term on invoices and other shipping documents or only on the contract is enough? I definitely put it on the invoice. 
very important to be on the commercial invoice uh, in addition to the PO, um, for sure. I'd chuck it on the packing list too if I would, if I could. Um, those are the two areas, commercial invoice and packing list, they, they, they really must be on if you want to make sure you're not going to get extra charges or you want to do your, your customs entry properly. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question, and then we'll let you guys off of the call. If your seller was shipping product into your FTZ for further processing, what Inco term would be best? Yeah, again, it's uh, if you, the seller is sending it to you to the FTZ. I would, uh, you know, buy that on an F on an F term again. So then I'm controlling it. I and uh, especially I have. The people here that can, you know, file a 214 for me to get into the zone properly, you know, I would not uh, rely on a shipper to get the, the a broker to, to handle that, especially with, you know, going into an FTZ, I'd, I'd shy away from that uh, right away, uh, because there's a lot of brokers out there that don't really do FTZ work, it's very highly specialized, so I would certainly recommend you buy on, you know, we always recommend the buy on the F term. If you're buying on the C, that's fine. At least you're controlling the customs clearance here, but a D is gonna get a little sticky and DDP, forget about it. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for um, attending today. We had uh, a really large crowd and we're excited to help you guys out and hopefully um, we can help you out some more if you guys have any questions. And I really appreciate your guys' expertise, Allison and Patrick today, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for everybody for joining us. We, we appreciate that.